Hi, folks. Steve Urban here. Today's episode of the Rutterflex podcast is sponsored by Marketing 360. My good friend J.B. Kellogg and his team do such a fantastic job for us and so many other companies. Marketing 360 is the number one platform for small business, and it's everything you need to grow your business. If you need marketing support, I really encourage you to contact them at marketing360.com slash writerflex, and we'll add that link to the description of this episode for easy reference. On today's episode of the Writerflex podcast, we have guest Steve Smith. He's the president and co-founder of Pet Relief, the premier provider of pet CBD oil. They offer organic pet CBD products such as oils, topical creams, and edibles for cats, dogs, and more. Oh, it's awesome. Steve, Steve, Steve Smith on the Rider Flex podcast today. How you doing, Steve? Oh, I'm doing great, Steve. How are you doing? Yeah. Hanging in there, man. We're uh, Hopefully, we're on the backside of this, maybe, at least, at least the fourth quarter of this coronavirus lockdown, I hope, as we're recording this on April 23rd, 2020. Right. Yeah, let's hope so. You know, but the, <laughs> you look at the good with the bad, though, Steve. For us, you know, it's forced me at least because I travel so much for the business that it's forced me to stop and take stock of kind of each little thing in life. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. any entrepreneur is going to tell you the same thing that it's you're busier than the wall, the one armed wallpaper hanger, as they say, right? You know, and I, I love being out in the field with our, you know, whether it's a one store customer or a big chain or something such as that. I, and and I do a lot for the hemp industry in general. So you know, it's take it's forced me to take stock. I actually bought a, a new mountain bike, and I've been biking to work every day. I'm like, oh my gosh, I finally have become a Coloradan. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, because you were a Florida guy for a long time. That's right. That's right. No, if you're on a bike in Florida, you either got a DUI or you're going to be <laughs> run over by an 80 year old. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny, and it's too hot to bike. I mean, you're oh, dying. Yeah. You're, you're, yeah, you're you're drenched in sweat by the time you get there. Tell, tell us about your personal life a little bit before we get into the business. Walk us through kind of where you grew up, some early life stuff. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, so I, I, I grew up in Indian River County, which is on the treasure coast of Florida, which is where they found all the pirate ships with all the Spanish doubloons and things. Cool. Uh, I was fourth generation from my county, so my kids are fifth generation from that county. Wow. Most of the cousins were in citrus and cattle and things such as that. And I was kind of the outcast, uh, the, the black sheep, the, the, I was the, uh, the redneck surfer in, in the family. So it'd be <laughs> family reunions and they'd be like, where'd this kid come from? You know, and I played, <laughs> and I played soccer instead of football, you know? Okay. Um, so kind of grew up there and from there went on to uh, uh, Florida state and uh, cool. master, uh, uh, sorry, majored in accounting and international business. And uh, from there, got a job with Deloitte. Out of were you always always good with numbers? I mean, you just loved numbers. You were a numbers guy, okay? Yeah, you know, both of my parents are really good with numbers. My dad, I was, I remember when I was like six, seven years old, I would like throw math uh, formulas or what's sixty-seven times twelve, and my dad could do it in like three seconds. Oh, wow! So wow. Uh, luckily, I, 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 I've inherited that gene from mom and dad and the what? hard work ethic. You know, my yeah, what they, what, yeah, what they do. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 So my dad, uh, he, he was with the state of Florida for 37, 39 years with department of corrections. He, he ran probation and parole for, there's like five circuits in Florida and he ran one whole circuit uh -huh. of Florida for, you know, just, you know, stayed dedicated, worked his tail off. And then my mom, uh, with, uh, with a high school degree went from a bank teller up to, you know, head commercial head of commercial lending for SunTrust Bank for a whole section of Florida. So I, 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 I saw how hard work and stick to itiveness, you know, that old Protestant work ethic, as they say, does yeah. pay rewards. You don't have to expect a lottery ticket, right? Like if you mm. really want something, you got to be willing to work for it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Brothers, sisters, are you the only kid? Uh, I had a brother. He, he passed away. He went to West Point, uh, but unfortunately he passed away back, uh, Wow, I was only 26 years old, so a long, long time ago. But um, okay. yeah, he was he was in the service, and uh, unfortunately, yeah, he passed away. Okay, okay. Well, thank you for thank you for sharing. That's one brother growing up. All right, so you you get out of Florida State. By the way, good time at Florida State, I'm guessing. Uh, from what I remember, 
<laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. I joke with, I joke uh, with my friends nowadays, you know, the guys from home, gals from home, and, uh, and, and the guys all went to University of Florida, and they would all rag on me. Oh, you're yeah. going to the girls' school. You're going to the girls' school. Uh, yeah, oh, well, yeah. Two, it took about two, three weeks into the first semester. All of a sudden, I got four or five of them sleeping on the floor in my dorm room. I'm like, <laughs> oh, I guess I am at the girls' school. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, cool. And then um, did you get recruited by Deloitte right out right out of school? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I got a job right out of school. And I'll, I'll give you a quick funny anecdote there. Price Waterhouse, which was the real buttoned-up one, I didn't – you know, I, I, I had jobs, helped put myself through college. I had scholarships for academics. And then I always had part-time jobs to pay for my surf trips and things such as that. Well, Price Waterhouse, I didn't have the 3.9, 4.0. So they politely interviewed me, but there's no way I was getting a job. <clears throat> so I get in the interview with Deloitte and the gentleman and the lady that were doing the interview, the guy happened to be a member of the fraternity that was right next door to the fraternity I was in. Ooh, okay. So he literally, he's flipping through my resume. We spent 20 minutes of the 30 minute interview bantering back and forth on who was the better sports fraternity and we did this they did that you're hired and he, and he told me at the end of the interview he goes you're coming to work for me and i'm like Sweet. looking at him and he didn't ask me any questions about accounting anything and i looked at him kind of puzzled he says you know why because you got a personality and you're good on your feet with people i was like okay that's kind of cool so yeah but deloitte man i'll tell you deloitte i, I really think deloitte is one of those you know when 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 any human, not just an entrepreneur, when you look back in your life at kind of like inflection points, mm. Deloitte absolutely was a massive inflection point in my life. Okay. I was exposed to men and women at the absolute top of the game. Mm. Uh, Crowley Maritime was, was one of my big clients, They're the largest family owned shipping company in all of North America. I'm in the room with the CFO quizzing him on things. Why did your accounts receivable go from 4.2% uh, uh, allowance for doubtful accounts go from 4.2% to 4.6% this year? I'm talking to the CFO of this big company. I'm like, well, oh, me, this kid. Great experience. You know? Great experience. Um, but you learned how to not be intimidated in those situations. And I always went in with the mindset of, I don't want to just ask my 10 canned questions. I want to hear how this company is number one or top mm. five in mm. its space mm. how do they do it if they're a just a shipping company which mm -hmm. to me is like who's got the lowest prices you know so how do people become successful in their various various mm. ways of doing it um so sounds like you had that uh, sounds like the entrepreneurial bug of wanting to know how you're running this business was in there early on yes <laughs> it, it, it really was that seed was always there yeah. i always i always loved searching for things that weren't just you know, in the box. Like I went and sought out my own creative writing course my junior year at FSU. I went through the whole list of 10,000 courses and I found a creative writing course. And, you know, I, I always just wanted to do more mm -hmm. than just, I get bored. Yeah, I, yeah. I, everyone tells me I'm like ADD, spazzo well, ADD guy. Sometimes, the, sometimes that, that uh, equals success. That personality yeah. will equal success. So you ran your own you, you consulted for a long time before you stepped out to, to be a co-founder with your wife and, and Pet Relief. Is that right? Yeah. So, well, it was consulting, but it was also full on sleeves rolled up real estate development. I see. So okay. We, we did everything from small uh, riverfront communities. We built um, a, a very sizable um, oceanfront estate that won all wow. kinds of awards with architectural digest and things such as that. Okay. Um, and then we even had one property. It was I, another one of these like crazy ideas I came up with that we were going to build a wakeboard ski and wakeboard lake community with high end homes because in Florida, the manatee laws had stopped us guys from being able to wakeboard anymore. So when there's no waves, we would wakeboard. Oh, so, I see. So you couldn't wakeboard anywhere. So I'm like, well, geez, we're just going to create our own. Um, <laughs> right. I, I, I had 18 out of the 20 um, home sites were sold. They'd already been designing homes. And that's when the real estate market like literally went off the deep end. So uh, we converted that property into a sand mine. Again, that entrepreneurial spirit of instead of sitting and feeling sorry for yourself, what do we do? Mm. Well, we, we did some soil borings and we found out that 10,000 years ago, that was the beach. 
where the property was. Really? Right? Where the oceans had receded. Okay. So we were, so we had a layer of about 20, 25 feet that was actually old at prehistoric beach sand. Cool. So we got a contract with the county through the state, which we had to, we had to outduel the Army Corps of Engineers. And I, I guess that's part of that crazy, mm -hmm. don't take no for an answer entrepreneur spirit people have to have, right? And mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so we got the contract and that at least paid some of the bills, but you know, then it, the real who estate market continued to go down. Yeah. Who were you partnering with? Was it, were you married at the time? Yes. Yes, sure was. And, and was we had, a we had a three generations worth of friends, uh, uh, someone that actually did banking with my mom for 20 years, um, oh, I see. high net worth family. So it was kind of like, I was the sweat equity partner. You know, I, I see. I had a little bit of cash in it, but you know, I had a I wonderful see. partner. Yeah. Yeah. I see. So you had some, some money partners, but you were working the business. Got it. Okay. Yes. All right. And so sounds like you guys were having fun, but then some real estate, the market was crashed a little bit there, but it's walk me through the transition when you're like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take some of the money we made here and somehow I'm going to enter CBD and cannabis. So like, how did that happen? Walk us through the transition. Oh man, this one, it found us. And uh, I try not to get emotional when I tell the stories, even right. after this many years, it still kind of grabs me, but uh, animal lovers will, will, will completely understand what I'm saying here. People that are not animal lovers might go, okay, this guy's kind of kooky, but that's fine. I, I, that's fine. It is, I, I wear that's it on my fine. sleeve, as you know, Steve, you and I hung <laughs> yeah. around quite a bit. So yep. Yep. Um, we had a family dog, Maddie, that had been there when both of our younger children, two boys were born. She was the family member not okay. just in words, literally. And she was the, this is where people are like, oh, you're kind of a kooky, but she was one of the animals that will come through your life where you can literally telepathically communicate. Mm, yep. She was my dog. And yep. as she, she would go run on the beach with me, you know, I'd go jog three, four miles. She'd go, she started getting older, hip joint pain, started progressing to arthritis. She really started notice, noticing her pain levels. Well, that, brought us to the veterinarian and they started mm -hmm. prescribing various pharmaceuticals that when I researched, the first one was banned for human consumption. So I'm like, okay, this is not helping. It's just prolonging. It's just slowing down, but it's not really helping the root cause of the problem. So we started searching for holistic or less impactful type uh, remedies, okay. products, whatever therapeutics we could find. So through that search, we know we found you know, there's Chinese herbs, different things that you know, had a lot of warnings and red flags. So being a surfer growing up, I was completely comfortable with cannabis. Right. <laughs> and yeah. uh, right. started studying the medical of the medical marijuana and went, holy cow, that's not just an excuse to get stoned. You actually <laughs> do have thousands of clinical studies that were started in Israel, Dr. Mekalam and his team that have now progressed. And, and it was accepted peer reviewed clinical studies and the beautiful thing that we discovered was that you can get the benefits of the cannabis plant without having to be intoxicated, high, stoned, whatever you want to call it. Exactly. Unfortunately, we lost Maddie before we could get set up here in Colorado, get the products going. But, you know. Um, what year was that? What year were you discovering? What year were you like, oh, wow, there's this, I can, yeah. give, CB, I can give CBD to myself or the animal. And it's going to have all these health benefits, but it's not going to get me stoned. What, what, when was that when you were, when you were investigating that? Yeah, we started looking at it like 2010 is when she started going downhill. And then that went through, you know, 2011, 2012. And then that, that's when she passed. And then that's when we came here to Colorado it was seven, eight, eight years ago now. Yeah, about did, eight you, years ago now. did you move to Colorado? Because you said, Hey, I've done enough study on this. I spent all this time studying this. I was going to, do some things to help my own animal. I think there's something here. Let's move to Colorado and start a business. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, I, be, being a Deloitte guy going along with my crazy entrepreneurship, I'm like, okay, we are going to do this. And Alina, my, you know, my co-founder, my wife, she was all in as well. We said, we're going to do this because there has got to be a better way. I see. And, and, and we knew that there was a way to do it. It was just, we had to find the people way smarter than us to do it okay. the best way. I, and the, and people, I see. Yeah. If I wanted to find people to get me the most stoned, Oh, no problem. I knew all no those problem. guys. Florida. 
so when you looked up, did you go online and you're like, uh, CBD for pets and like nothing's coming up back then? Nothing. Oh, nothing. I see. Nothing. I see. And, and so you that's, moved why to, came, that's why we I came see. to Colorado is because the uh, penetration of pet parents that treated the animals as true family members was much higher here. Yes, It was true. Colorado, Oregon, and somewhat in Southern California, but that was just way too expensive to try and start a business with taxes and everything okay. else. Okay. Um, yep. You know, yep. we bootstrapped it on our own as a crazy entrepreneur typically does with a crazy off the wall idea like this, you know, pot for pets. My friends are like, you're going to do pot for pets. What? And I'm like, yeah, no. so let, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let's take a deep breath there. So let me make sure yeah. you, you got, you got this business going on yeah. in Florida. You got this real estate stuff going on. Yeah. And at some point you say, let's, let's leave all this. Let's, I'm guessing you had a little bit of money, right? To bootstrap it, to bootstrap yeah. your new business. Yeah. And yeah. you moved to, you moved to Colorado. You got no connections. You got no job. Right. You're gonna, you're, yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> and you're yeah. going to, you're going you're gonna to start this business. Wow. How, how much, do you remember how much runway you had with cash? Were you thinking, okay, we got, I got a year's, I got a year's worth of cash to get this going. Like, talk to me about that scary part where you're like, yeah, we just came here and got this thing going. I think that's our listeners. They're always fascinated by like, well, shit, how did you, how'd you do that, bro? What did you eat ramen noodles for six months? How'd you do that? Can, 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 you, can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, the, the, this part of the, this part of the, uh, the biography, the narrative is even more crazy than the average entrepreneur I would think because we made the move I was still commuting back and forth to Florida to work with our real estate development stuff okay. and this is when you know things were bad but um and we were cash flowing the developments and things but okay. some things outside of Florida that had nothing to do with our developments hit my investment partner and that filtered down to us so I went from having an eight digit net worth with cat, you know, and most of that was in real estate uh, valuations. But a payroll you know, check coming in. <laughs> you know, with, with management management fees every month that were helping support things, and we, you know, we saved money. I had retirement four hundred one k, all that stuff. Okay. Um, and some equity from the house that we took with okay. us, and you know, we rented here in the beginning. So anyway, okay. we went from net, a positive, you know. 12, 15 million net worth. We went to basically that in the negative side. We went way below zero because the banks all bum rushed our properties and showed up at our door saying, here, uh, Mrs. Smith, you owe us $25 million in 60 days. It was <laughs> horrible. While and you're, that, while, while you're trying to start the other business. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so thank God I've got some just really close friends since college days that have some successful businesses. So I had a couple buddies throw a little bit of cash in okay, to keep things going. But you know, your, your, your ask about ramen noodles and stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we, it was tough, man. It, we, we had to, you know, borrow money. I'm in my forties at this point, early forties. I'm going to hit my money up. I had my parents up for money each month to live. I'm like, are you kidding me? Wow, it was bro. bad, man. We no, were let me get, were your parents, by the way, okay with you and cannabis when you were in school and college? Were your parents oh, cool no. with? Oh. <laughs> Actually, so, you know what though? I, so, I will say this: if Dad watches this, he's going to go, "Oh my gosh!" But you know, even with his position with law enforcement, he saw the effects. Not to get off on a tangent here, but he yeah, saw yeah. the effects of the marijuana laws on minorities. How much it I really see, screwed see. those people. So I he see. always used to say, "Even when I was in college, he goes, yeah, it's not popular. I would never say it at work, but." It's like, I would well, rather you do that sometimes than be drinking. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. The reason yeah. I asked that question, though, is because I'm just thinking, based on what I knew your dad did for a living, you're living in yeah. Colorado. You're, you're calling him, hey, dad, I know I'm 40, uh, and, I, and I, I, I need, right. not only is that a bad age to ask for, for money, but I'm asking for money for my CBD cannabis company. Right, <laughs> right. Oh, man, I'm sure that didn't go well around church. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but that's so good. All right. So you, you officially launch Pet Relief. With, by the way, was that the name in the very beginning too? Pet yes. Relief? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Alina you came offici- up with that. She's brilliant with coming up with names. That, All right. Uh, All right. Yeah. So Alina, so you and Alina founded it together, but you had some, you had some investors that had some equity too, but you guys were the co-founders. Oh yeah. Yeah. We, we still own the vast, vast majority of the business. Yeah. Good for you, man. Congratulations. So you start Pet Relief in 2014. Yeah, right. That's when it officially incorporated or uh, we set up the LLC in Florida officially back then. But we had okay. already been, obviously, like we spoke about, 
you know, two years of R and D and all that stuff. But yeah, 2014 is the official start. Uh, how how long did it take to get cash flow positive? Where you actually you looked at the the, the, the P and you looked at the P and L statement down at the bottom. There was a positive number. <laughs> it was literally cash flow positive took until late 2016. Okay. Begin, or really spring of 2017 is when it started turning cash flow positive, but we still couldn't pay ourselves anything but peanuts at that point. You know. Yeah, you were, as yeah. you know, Steve, cash flow positive. I, does not mean you're paying yourself money. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> Everybody always asks us that at RiderFlex. They're like, well, are you cash flow positive? And I said, well, yeah, the first two years, I guess we were technically, but Scott and I didn't pay ourselves anything. So, <laughs> right. You know how it works, uh, yeah, man. Yeah, that's how it works. Okay. So, but, but, so you get it going. Nobody else is doing this. So let's do this. For the listeners, why don't you give a nice overview of Pet Relief today for the listeners sure. that have no idea, never been to the website. Give us, sure. a, uh, give us a nice overview. Go ahead. So, so Pet Relief, you know, we are honored uh, and very proud to say uh, with our feet planted firmly on the ground, because we've already seen what uh, a little bit of hubris can do to you when you think you're unbeatable with the real estate stuff, right? So, right, right. Um, but, but we're the number one pet CBD brand in the world. According to Brightfield Group in 2018, we control awesome. 65%, 65% of the pet what? CBD. What? What? Yeah. And wow. so in comparison, Steve, the largest human CBD company, obviously the pie is much larger, but yeah, they but control 9%. On the human side, we control sixty five percent. Sixty five percent of the pet yeah. CBD market. Yeah, that's incredible. Okay, sorry, didn't yeah. mean to pause you. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, that's and and we we're, we're quite proud of that. But we we feel that we've absolutely earned that position in the marketplace because of the way we have set up the business, you know. Um, and then in twenty nineteen, we somewhere between forty and forty five percent because of the influx of so many just mom and pop brands that are. Yeah. Some, are, some of them aren't even legal, but obviously the pie was much bigger. So we've continued exponential growth through 2019. So as of today, you know, we're in April, late April of 2020. And uh, we're now in 7,500 retail doors around the U.S., including nice. the, we just launched with Petco in 22 states uh, at the beginning of this month. Nice. It's not the best month we have launched in since Still. no one can go into stores. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. What, uh, uh, we're just... launching in Europe uh, in July. We already have a PO in hand. So our, our products will start hitting shelves in Europe in the months of July and August. Um, so, you know, we're, we, we feel good about the company we've created and the moral values that still run through the blood of everyone that works on the team, you know. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're quite honored and proud to be in our position. Are you selling through Amazon? No, I am no. not. No, I hope none of the Amazon people are ready to like destroy me somehow, but we want nothing to do with the Amazon. And okay. it's, it's a personal thing with me, okay. with our family, because my family, you know, our, our daughter's actually one of the co-founders as well. The three of us are, you know, there's a, there's a place for Amazon. Absolutely. But you know, Okay. The, 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 you know, we, we prefer the brick and mortars. We like that yeah. personal touch. With but you products. are selling, you, can you buy through your website? Can I buy yes. product from your website directly to my house? Yes, correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What, what percentage of the business is e-commerce versus brick and mortar? Oh, so at the end of 2019, it was about 20% e-com. Okay. Uh, but right now, because so many stores are closed, Right. Um, they're, they're, you know, a lot of the stores are sending them to us online because, you know, if the, if the pet is suffering or, you know, is, is, has high anxiety issues, mm -hmm. if they can't get it at Joe's pet shop at the corner, you know, they, they need a solution there. So and, yeah, e-coms. Okay. Yeah, 20%. Yeah. All right. And, and how many employees today? Employees? Yeah. Oh, well, we including, so we have a joint venture kitchen now. So we have a 25,000 square foot dedicated manufacturing facility that does all of our baked goods and all that stuff. Okay. So even though I don't sign those paychecks, they work only for us. So if you okay. count them, if you count those folks, we're at 75, 80 total. All right. All right. And can you share how big the company is in volume? Are you still a private company? You'd rather not go there or I don't know. What do you, how big is the company now? Yeah. Revenue well, is? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. Last year, you know, we were between 12 and 15 million. Um, nice. This year, you know, we've had this little hiccup. So, you know, again, caveat, depending how long this lasts, yeah. 
but we're launching our veterinarian line and our equestrian lines in Europe. Um, you know, we originally thought we were going to be between 25 and 30 this year. So maybe that's down to, you know, maybe we end up at 20 to 25, depending on how long the coronavirus drags on the retail sales. But still, I mean, hey, you got it up to 12, 15 million in less than five years. Your cash flow positive. You still own a majority of the company. You got 75 employees and you're loving life in Colorado. I mean, hey, come on. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> not bad. That's not, pretty not, good. Not, not that, you know, that's pretty I'm, good. That's I pretty good. Up, I wake up and, uh, and, I, and I say my thanks during my meditation every morning. You know, that's great. Can, can you tell me, let me ask a couple of questions around the difference between a little bit deeper on the difference between you and some of these others, right? I mean, if I, I mean, damn, I get CBD notifications every day from somebody. I'm on all these emails. Somebody's, somebody's trying to sell me. I saw a post the other day, speaking of the coronavirus, I was laughing my ass off. Maybe I shouldn't laugh at this, but somebody was posting like, get your CBD infused mask. And I was like, what the hell? Yeah. What are, okay, what are we yeah. doing? What are we doing? <laughs> but it's anyway, crazy, yeah. crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. So how do you distinguish yourself in this, this uh, noise now? Uh, Cause when you first started, like you said, when you first started, not very many people doing it, but now there's a lot more noise and BS out there. What's the difference between the product I order from you and everybody else? And, that, and I think, and well, no, I don't think, I know that this is why we're still the commanding market leader is because of that trust factor. Okay. Their survey last year said more parents are reading labels and buy organic or almost always organic for their pets than they do for their children by like a 25, 30% <laughs> swing. I mean, we're That's talking right. massive difference. So when they go into stores or they start investigating, hey, I heard this CBD stuff might work. I'm a veterinarian told me to look into CBD. Yeah. And they see that Pet Relief has complete control of the entire process from the time that seed goes in the ground here in Colorado until the time it gets CO2 extracted, until the time it ends up in a final product and then is in the pet parent's hands, Pet Relief controls that entire process. There's not one other pet CBD brand that can say that that has any any scale whatsoever there's a couple really small brands that may have their hand in part of the manufacturing or, or life cycle of the product mm -hmm. but we're the only one so that farm to table mentality that so many people yeah. have these days you can trace your product that you bought from me steve all the way back to last year we had uh five big fields so we do farm tours so, you know, if you go on the website, we show you video. Here's our pet relief specific fields. Nice. Um, and people know that because if they're, it's like, if you're going to put it in your child, or your pet's bodies, you want to know that some guy's yeah. not just a fancy marketer that knows how to play the uh, internet game. That's exactly right. And for the listeners, I just want to clarify. Yeah. So pet relief isn't just buying uh, biomass from some unknown producer and slapping a label on it, right? Which is what most of the other CBD companies are doing. Isn't that, isn't that accurate? Oh, I, I, I mean, any, any of them that have a footprint, even kind of remotely national, yeah. they don't, they, some of them don't even touch their products at all. They have what's called 3PL. They'll have a yeah. middleman that even does all the fulfillment for them. Yeah. So, and again, I'm not knocking, I'm not, I'm not trying to yeah. denigrate any other companies. It's just, we have a different business model. Do you do you obsessed own, with being the absolute best every time? I love that. Do you own the farms too? Do the do the farmer? Do you own the land, or do you have a contract with the farmers and they exclusively grow? For, how does that work? That's a great question, and that's and that's why we've partnered with family farmers here in Colorado. So okay. we don't actually own the land, but okay. so for example, this year, Steve, we signed an eighteen a total of eighteen million dollars in farming contracts for our products. So okay. we contract grow. So I have expert farmers that are part of our joint venture. They will either go help you grow. It's your first year ever doing it. So they will literally kind of hold your hand through the whole planting and harvesting season. Oh. Or if you've now been with us for say two, three years, you know what you're doing now. And you can make more money by just doing it all yourself. And then we have custom, they're kind of like corn combines that our guys have literally customized to be able to handle hemp stalk, et cetera. So we'll still bring our harvesters in to do the harvest. I did uh, not know. That's a great question. I was asking, I live up uh, northern, in northern Colorado in a very small town where I see a lot of the farmers in the local tavern that I uh, yeah. want to start going to again pretty soon. 
Uh, but uh, anyway, I asked a couple of the farmers, I'm like, do you have like, a, are, are there combines that can, that can cut this stuff? I thought it was a hand, still a hand crop, but, uh, yeah. but now, but go ahead. Yeah, no, and, and most of the people are still trying to hand harvest. Okay. So growing up, again, this is maybe some of my life experiences have all happened this way for a reason, but growing up in a kind of a citrus and cattle family, more or less, I saw the trials and tribulations of farming. And yeah. I knew that the marijuana guys that are trying to transfer into hemp, they never had a snowball's chance in hell to scale. Right. Because imagine trying to go hand cut and these, yeah. you're not just going out with a sickle like it's wheat. This yeah. stuff has the tensile power of essentially bamboo. Oh, so so there are zeros economies of scale for them. So that's why we partnered with a, a wonderful family. The Dyer family were our very first ever partners. Um, right. Our first year we planted 25 acres and it was a shit show. <laughs> because <laughs> there's no guidebook. There's no guidebook. Right, right. <laughs> That's my warning. Probably a lot of your people listening, Steve, are like, hey, my cousin's got 100 acres in Tennessee. <laughs> I'm not trying to scare anybody off in a self-serving way. Let me tell you. We, yeah. we, we, we kind of joke at the farms. Um, you know, it's all these people are like, oh, I'm going to get into him. I'm going to make millions of dollars. And I say, uh -huh. good luck. I'm joining yeah, the party yeah. and watch yourself cry misery the first two years like we did. By the way, I say the same thing when people call me. They're like, hey, I saw your podcast. I'm, I'm going to start a podcast, too. And I'm, I always go, <laughs> I always go, yeah, yeah. Let me, call, me, call me in six months. Let me know how that goes. That's right. <laughs> no, I know. So, okay, very good. That really separates you. I really appreciate you talking about some of that stuff on, on how you're different from all these other places where I see you can supposedly buy CBD. But uh, that, that's really a big one, knowing you have a relationship with these farmers, you know exactly what, from the time it's planted all the way through in the bottle to your house. That's, that's huge. And by the way, your reputation online is great. I mean, you're following on social media, you know, the reviews, the reputation, and that's so important, yeah, right? Absolutely. I mean, oh, oh my God. Um, Steve, let me you ask know what? You. Funny yeah. point. I can't use the name yet because we're under an NDA right now, but a famous movie star. Oh, reached out to us yesterday out of nowhere sweet and i'm like okay this is a hoax and right, so right. Our, our our younger people that are digital savvy experts you know, they went and actually contacted instagram to make sh for damn sure but it's it's this famous movie star that's apparently obsessed with our products because her her dogs were like in bad shape for some again i can't go into all the details but completely these are her babies completely changed these people's lives and it's not even asking for anything it's like please just, send me stuff i'm gonna post stuff about you guys i'm obsessed with your products for free what? for free there's a famous person uh, saying she'll say she'll promote yes. for free yes <laughs> because because literally uh, like you know they kind of instagram message direct whatever right back yeah and yeah and she's saying you literally saved xyz dog's life and like, wow. i can see i can see you in the meeting going hmm let me see do we want to do that yes okay go ahead <laughs> right <laughs> that's hilarious yeah. let me but that's let me why we do this every day steve like yeah, honestly not yeah. to sound like cheesy but yeah. that's what gets us up that's why we work our tails off and in the yeah. way because it's that's why because in memory of maddie it's when you're doing stuff the right yeah. way and these people yeah. call we have people call literally like choking back tears thanking yeah. us and it's like, man, there's, this, you know, and that's really what it's about, right? I mean, you're, you're, you love, I think you love being an entrepreneur. I mean, knowing you, I know you love the, the energy and the passion and the, and the, and the stress and the, and the challenges of running a business. But yeah, for you, it's all about the pets too. And like, Hey, you're making yeah. a difference. You're making a difference in a, a, a relative's life, right? Like your, your pets, you, you can, you can really help people make a difference in their pets lives. And I think that's obviously that's where the passion is. Um, and if I, and we're the same, we're dog lovers here. Yeah. Right. Um, and you know, if I know that I can give them CBD product and it's going to make the, make them have a better life, uh, especially towards the end of life or if they have arthritis or whatever, and I know it can help them feel better. Hey, I'm all for it. I'm all yeah. for it. Yeah. Uh, cause I know I use CBD for myself for, for my own arthritis. So I'm assuming if I can buy the right product for my pet, it's going to make them feel better too. Right. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. By the way, I just, I just gave away my age telling all the listeners I have arthritis. So, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple of uh, questions. I know we're getting, uh, we're running close to our time limit here, but entrepreneurial advice, if you had to give 
a couple of pieces of advice to aspiring entrepreneurs who, even if it's not CBD or cannabis, you know, they just, they have, let's, let's say they're in real estate. Let's say they're in commercial real estate, which right now, I don't know if I'd want to be in considering everybody's going to try to work remotely now. A commercial real estate office space might be a little scary place to be, but let's say they're in real estate and they want to start their own business. And they were like you thinking about start, starting a business. What, what advice would you, would you give those people? You know, I, I get asked that quite a bit by, by young people and, and mm -hmm. associates. People message me on LinkedIn and I'm like, why are they asking me? Because, <laughs> you know, but you, you made it, bro. Though, you know? Yeah, you made it. Yeah, you it, made it. You did it. it it's, and, but, I, but I love giving advice and trying to help young people that have, have a passion. That's the most important thing, Steve. And you mentioned it a couple of times now in our interview and in our, in our podcast, podcast here is that mm -hmm. you have to be truly Yes. Passionate that you can't barely sleep. It wakes you up in the middle of the night. You're so passionate about it. If you're going to be successful as an entrepreneur, the highest, mm -hmm. highest way you're going to succeed is to have a passion that it's nothing about the damn money. Yeah. And it's not, oh, let me chase the, the new Bitcoin idea. Or let me chase the new yeah. uh, spring water. I, I'm looking at my bottled water over here. Yeah. You know, you know, you can't chase something that you are not absolutely passionate about as an entrepreneur. That's good stuff. Some entrepreneurs that are serial entrepreneurs, they see an idea and they can capitalize it. Yeah, those are outliers. The, the, the vast majority of entrepreneurs that have started from zero and bootstrapped something to a big success, especially something that's relatively new, like what we did, mm -hmm. you have to be so passionate that you're willing to give everything. You know, we had two little kids. Like I said, we're borrowing money off our parents with two, like a first grader, a second grader, and a fourth grader. You know, I mean, you talk about humble pie. I forgot but, to mention that. I forgot to mention that earlier when you were like having to yeah. call your dad. You're having to call your dad for money and all that. I forgot to mention that you also had two little kids at home too. Right. <laughs> Otherwise, dad probably would have said, go get a damn job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's so critical. You know, Lena always passion. said back yeah. in the day when it was like tough days, Steve, she would yeah. say, you know what? There's no way we are going to fail. This is going to succeed because it has to. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, that's the spirit that people have to have because there's yeah. going to be, you know, unless you just got lucky or you have yeah. a, a, a rich uncle that's giving you a million bucks just to try to start <laughs> your, your thing, you know, you, you've got to have a, a drive and a stick to -itiveness. That's the other secret formula that I would say, Steve, you, it, it is an extremely lonely journey in the early days it is. when you're just bleeding money, hemorrhaging money. Am I going to make it two more months? Uh, you know, my, you know, PayPal shut us down early days because people were using PayPal to sell marijuana with fake CBD websites. So, so we lost all credit card processing for like three months. I mean, that almost killed us like the entire business. And um, so Passion. it went, yep. It, it, that, that's the other big piece of advice I would give is have at least either a extremely solid mentor or advisor that's helping you along the way guide here and there mm -hmm. have people around you you're starting it with that you can absolutely trust that's why so many successful businesses and are come from families then the families all hate each other after five six years or they're always scrapping like we have, we have plenty of knockdown drag outs with, with the family now, but we all know it's for a reason. But yeah, that, yeah, that's what I would say, that passion. And have people with you that are just as passionate and that you know damn well you can trust. You know, I, I like what you mentioned about your wife earlier saying, we are not going to fail. My wife and I, when we started RiderFlex, you know, very similar, you know, lots of ramen noodle uh, times there in the beginning. And, and I would say to her sometimes when she would be complaining about the money or whatever, I'd say, do you want to, you want to stop? You want me to just close it? You want me to just, we'll just, I'll just go get another executive job, I guess. And she'd be like, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're not doing that. I'm just having a vent. I'm just venting for a moment. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's See, really critical. You had somebody, you had yep. somebody in your life yep. and yep. it doesn't have to be a spouse or a girlfriend, boyfriend somebody, yeah, you know, past yeah. business associate that you just hit the nail on the head. You know, that gave you that little oomph to keep going on a day yeah. when you were like, damn, is this going to work? Yeah, absolutely. No, that's awesome. absolutely. How about a quick question around, um, we do a lot of job interviewing slash career advice for candidates. And I know mm -hmm. now 75 employees, you've had the, the business going for several years. So you've obviously now hired and 
and brought on lots of employees. Um, any quick tips around, any quick tips for job candidates that might be applying at Pet Relief and maybe tie that into some of the common mistakes you see when you're interviewing somebody? <laughs> yeah, you know, we, we think through that because I, I do the least canned interview style probably of anybody in the planet. I just, I, I don't go in there and go, so tell me about a time that you got told no by a boss. And I don't do any of that. You're not looking at a list. I'm guessing you're not looking at a list or anything. Yeah, because I want to see, do they have the ability to blend into the culture? So okay. at least at Pet Relief, the number one recipe for success is that you're going to be able to blend into the culture because yeah. we're not the normal executive, you know, we're not an IBM or something like that, which yeah. I mean, those companies are great, but they have very structured kind of uh, systems and things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. You know, again, relating it to our experience in, in particular, there's never a boring day in CBD. I mean, I, I shared with you before we came live, Steve, about one of the largest credit card processors just shut down CBD for the retailers across the country. These are the kind of things that happen in CBD world. So if you can't be flexible and, and be quick on your feet and not lose it because something came up as a roadblock out of nowhere, uh, you won't succeed not... in CBD in general, and you damn sure wouldn't succeed at pet relief because it's, yeah. <laughs> it's always changing, you know? And I think that's probably a, something for life anyway, because even oh, sure, if you're an sure. accountant, like my days at Deloitte, you know, it wasn't every day some crazy thing would happen, but I mean, shit, Steve. Yeah. So there, there would be like, you know, a client would have an issue or, you know, there, there was always something that something. if you, if you weren't able to pivot and laugh and stay positive about, yeah, you're not going to make it. So if a, so if a candidate comes into pet relief and they say, um, yes, I want a very structured black and white atmosphere where I do the same thing <laughs> every day. And it, <laughs> you're just, you're just going to be like interview over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it wouldn't work. I mean, even our accounting department, I mean, it's the same thing. You know, it's, you know there, there are no, you know. Regular days. There, there, are, there are no regular days. <laughs> That's bingo. And we love it. <laughs> oh, at least I do. Uh, la yeah. la last two questions. I, I know I'm all, I could keep you on for another hour, by the way. I'd love to do a podcast where we were doing it over happy hour, too. Uh, be, dude, I think that would be really time. That'd be really fun. Two more questions. Um, if you could call that young man coming out of Florida State, I'm guessing you were 21 or 21 or something like 2021 or something around in there. If you could call him and tell him anything, what would you say today? Oh, geez. You know, I've thought about that because I, you know, I had a friend ask me that, like actually my college roommate, he's like, you know, if we could go back to that, what would you like? He asked me that question. Yeah. I'm like, shit, man, I don't think I would really do anything different because all those life experiences brought me to here today. Mm -hmm. I probably, the one thing I would say is, but I did do this. So I worked my tail off at Deloitte and with a client and I actually traveled around the world surfing for a year and a half. So oh, I, was going to, I was going to say stop and smell the roses more, but if anybody that knows me heard me say that, they would just laugh their ass off that <laughs> I said that. But um, I think this is what a lot of people would say though is, Take time to call your mom, take time okay. to call your dad because, you know, I, I, and, and your, and your loved ones. Cause I lost my brother and I've carried mm. that guilt to today mm. that I was so damn busy and kind of yep. not self-absorbed, but just busy in the day to day that I wasn't. So when I lost him, it was like, Oh shit. Yeah. The what ifs and the, yep. you know, yep. that, that, that'd be the advice I would give is, yep. you know, it Make is sure important. the ones around you know, because in this day and age, everything is so fast and instant gratification, mm. especially in this day and age. It is true, right? You definitely need to make a point to stay close to family because, by the way, when the crap hits the fan, the family is what's going to be there. That's right. That's <laughs> so right. So you got to stay close to them. Last, the very last question then is, if you had to put your core purpose in life into a sentence and... I kind of ask you to uh, uh, set the family aside, no, knowing that your wife and children, obviously your primary core purpose, but aside from your immediate family, how would you describe your core purpose in life? And I'll tell you, it's the company mission statement. And okay. that is, we are on a mission to change what healthy means for pets. Oh, I like it. 
I and like we it. think what that does is it creates a ripple effect where by improving pets' lives, that it improves that household, which makes it for a more harmonious, happy household in general, which then now your pet is in a better position, Steve, instead of stress, and you go to work today, you're in a better mood, you're a little happier than you would have been if, if Fluffy was suffering, you're down, right? Now yep. you're a little happier when you go to work. You share that positivity with the, your coworkers, and it's the ripple effect in the world. It's kind of the, you know, uh, Alina and I both have a, a the ohm symbol on the back of our neck. We believe that you know if you if you emit positive energy, you help create positive energy around you, and that it continues and it can travel the world. So, I that's, like it. That's, you know, I like that's my it. thought there. I like it, my friend. Steve, thank you so plus much I'm, for, plus, for. Plus, I'm trying to make up for some of those college days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to talk about some more of those and the surfing trip for the year and a half. The next time I see you, I want to get yes. into some more details there. Thank you, thank you so much for being on the Rider Flex podcast and sharing your awesome story. I really appreciate it, and uh, congratulations on everything you guys have built. Really, super yeah. happy for you. Super happy. Thank for you, you, Steve. It's been an honor, and I look forward to seeing you here over the next week or two over a beer. Sounds good, sir. Take care. We'll talk soon, okay? The Rider Flex podcast features entrepreneurs, business executives, and the stories behind how they got there, as well as daily tips on career advice and job interviews. Our show can be heard just about anywhere these days, but you can visit riderflex.com and click on the podcast page to hear all the previous episodes and learn more about the recruiting and consulting services we provide. Contact us at the email address info at riderflex.com or 888-964-5876. Thanks so much for listening. And if you enjoy our show, please be sure to subscribe to our channel and like the episodes.